Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks for your time in attending this live workshop today. I really appreciate your attendance. I know you're all super busy and there's lots of events to attend. So I hope to make this one really worthwhile for you and I would value your feedback at the end. I've timed it at about 45 minutes. So that should leave plenty of time if you've got any specific questions about the fundraising process that I can answer at the end. So it'd be great uh, to hear from you a little bit more about yourself. And while we're waiting for others to join, if you want to just put into the chat a little bit about yourself, um, your name, where you're from, and one thing you want to get out of the workshop today, that'll be really useful to me as we go along. Um, see, there's a few people joining in. That's great. Okay, I'll manage that as we go along. Okay, so you're here today for Beat the Odds, Navigate Your Company's Fastest Way to Investment. Thanks for joining. Okay, and this is hopefully you know, a chance for you to, to get a little bit interactive. <laughs> I will be sending you a recording straight afterwards, but um, if you want to ask any questions at any time, just please put them into the chat or the comments section, depending on where you're going. Excellent, thank you. Okay, and uh, when these two little guys pop up on the screen, let me know sitting back with your popcorn like these two, this will be your chance to, uh, to give me a little feedback and give me a little bit of idea of where you're at in your fundraising journey. So let's go ahead and do that there, pop it into the chat. One line description of your company, whoop, um, your name and something that you hope to get out of this workshop. Pop it into that, brilliant. Exploring new ways to fund business growth, that's really useful, that's what we're here to do. Okay, excellent. Right, so to come in, brilliant. Okay, so here's what we're gonna be covering. By way of introduction, I'll be outlining the, the difficult process that it is to grow a successful technology company and why the sort of the structures seem to be set up to be mainly focused on securing investment. We'll have a discussion on the main options available if you're seeking to raise significant funding. And then we'll start to go in yeah. and into, into the mindset of an investor and particularly look at what they want and how they go about getting it. Because that will hopefully will make you start to think about the approach you're using to secure funding. And then finally, I'll outline for you a, a new approach to slash the odds, time and the effort involved in securing in engagement from investors, that vital first stage in getting your offer in front of the right investors. Okay, a few more people coming in. That's excellent. Just going to mute people as they come in, just in case. No problem. Excellent. Good stuff. Brilliant. So just to get this sort of my, one of my bugbears out of the way, um, I know that you know when a lot of people talk about technology, especially if it's in the US, they tend to mean just information technology. But for me, my definition of technology is much broader. It's any product that involves the technology components uh, and innovation. And I tend to work with uh, those who are bringing something that's genuinely new to the world, to the market, that most difficult of, of challenges. So you're not just simply producing a Me Too product and in a better way, but you're producing something that doesn't currently exist, something that's way better, way faster, and much more added value than what's currently out there. So that's where we start from. And we know the journey is a difficult one. Excellent, a few more people joining, lovely. That you're not only do you have to start the company and you've got to do the normal things any new company owner has got to do, but at the same time, you've got to develop this brand new offer, an offer that's brand new to the world, something that customers really need. And I've highlighted that word because it, for me, it's very important. There's a big difference in producing a technology product that's maybe not be around for the long term, that doesn't disrupt the market, that just is something that consumers can take it or leave it. What I'm really 
interested in is working with those companies who are bringing something that's brand new to the market that customers just can't live without. Okay, so that kind of sets the scene, hopefully. And obviously, at the same time as you're building this offer, you've got to you know, raise awareness of what you're doing because people not, may not know about your offer, your solution. And, and also at the same time as building that sort of market, you've obviously got to secure the finance for its development and testing until it's ready to sell. So we know this journey is difficult. We can look at a little bit of, of why, and I won't go too much into the theory here, just a quick um, overview, but you'll probably be aware of the, the, the process of developing a brand new technology from you know, early what they call technology readiness level, which is something NASA invented in the 70s at uh, the left-hand side of your screens, all the way through to something that's viable in the market, operates at a scale that industry and commercial world can use in the sort of seven, eight, and nine. And what you've got to do is obviously, as you're developing your product, is you've got to finance that development. And just a, a description of the different phases in case this is uh, particularly new to you. The technology readiness level concept applies for both hardware and software type products. And they see it through all the way from sort of experimental basic research into over the the level of development, which we call translational funding in the middle, and into uh, securing commercial funding at the right-hand end of, of the scale. So it would be useful for me, just for those who are, are founders and developing something at the moment, if you could pop into the, the comment section or the chat box, which TRL you know, your innovation currently is at, just so that I've, I'm aware of, you know, of how far you've traveled on your path. And the issue with this development of these brand new innovations is that the funding available is only available at either end of the, the technology readiness level spectrum. Either when you're underpinning the, you know, doing the research that underpins the innovation, which is typically funded by governments, grant funding, and on the other side of the, what I call the valley of death, commercial funding from early stage investors right the way through to commercial income. And there's a, a lack of funding in this middle section, the what we call translational funding, where you're developing a much more advanced and market ready prototype than you would do in the scientific environment. And that's what we call the valley of death. And the lack of funding there you know, is also mirrored by a kind of a, an approach to risk that you know, the risk of an investor uh, or technology failing is very high at the uh, lower stages of one, two, threes and decreases over time, over maturity, and the potential returns that an investor would get back from their, their investment in your innovation is, is based on the on opposite curve. The start's very low, they're unlikely to see their money back in a long time for the early stages, and it increases as the TRL level increases. So either way, you both produce this kind of valley of death. And that's where, you know, and sadly, technology companies go to die through a lack of access to this financing. Okay. And these are the you know, concerning statistics that nine out of every 10 early stage technology startups fail. And for me, that yes, that means the company going out of business, but this means also you know, founders' dreams not being fulfilled, backers of these companies not seeing their money again. But most important personally to me, that good science has not fulfilled its potential in solving the problems in the world that created it, created the need for it. And this is exactly why I, I founded PBM Consulting, to help more science and technology companies make their impact in the world and make it over the valley of death into commercial success. And I looked around when I started this company in September 2020 at sort of what support was around and the way in which many technology startups were going about fundraising. And it seems to be the, these things, what I, what, these pains is what I tried trying to um, eradicate from the market, that the fundraising process can take an awful lot of time if you're finding your own way in there, making your own mistakes, learning from them, gradually getting better at targeting the right sort of investors, that you know, there's a risk that your company will run out of money before you secure your next funding round. And without sort of a, a, you know, a different approach and a, um, 
Ooh, there we go. Or you have know, an alternative approach. Taking it can take years to get this sort of investment. I once saw a company that's been working to try and get their offer launched in the market for four years, four years working without any sizable income into the business, which for me is just you know too high a risk for for technologies to, to come to technology companies to take. There's a risk the longer it takes you, of course that that's a competitor will beat you to the punch and get a product on the market that solves the same problem that yours does. And obviously it takes an awful lot of, of energy and time and resources in doing the fundraising process on your own without sort of sufficient help or guidance. That should have an impact on yourself, your health, your family's health, loss of team members, overall burnout, and overall an ability to, to re realize the vision that you started out we're for the company. So that's you know the reasons why I founded the company and what I'm trying to do here, trying to help founders. So we've got some stuff in the chat here. Just have a quick look at that. Excellent. Thank you for putting that. Automated the platform. So you've you dropped back down the readiness scale. Yeah, absolutely. That's a that is an issue. Okay. Good. Thanks for those. Keep the chats coming in. So Whatever stage you're at in your journey, and if you put that into the chat, thank you very much. Um, the current model you know, suggests that you need funding to do that. So how far have you got? And if you've got experience of doing this before, fundraising before, um, or you've been doing this for a while, just let me know how you've been getting on. Be useful to know. And obviously, the structure of, of fundraising as it's currently set up, if you go to you know, the, the free courses you can find on the internet about fundraising, you'll get the, the rather less than useful advice of how to fundraise, which is create a pitch deck, find the investor's email, send them an email, pitch deck, follow up. And that's the sort of the, uh, the mentality and the approach that leads to it taking 18, 24 months plus to get funding to your company. Because when you do that, you've handed over control to the investors. They're in control of the sales process. You're the one chasing them. And you can spend your life uh, running around after the wrong investors without a different approach. I see as well this kind of approach that you may come across investors who you think just don't understand your particular offer, your technology. And maybe this is because you know, founders are typically interested in the things that they're interested in and investors theirs. And we tend to, to talk about what we want rather than what our audience really wants to know. What your innovation is and how it works is not what an investor wants or needs to know. So this can occur when founders are approaching this with you know, passion and belief in the technical ability of their innovation to solve the problem but the investor are actually looking for much more belief in the commercial model and the, the scalability and the, the industrial need for your innovation. So there's a bit of a mismatch. Oop, da -da -da. Oop, that's the wrong button. Okay, oh, there we go. And the perceived option of you know, going it alone is, is a perceived easy option because, you know, like I said, you've got this kind of passion and belief in what you're doing and your concept and you've fallen in love with it. And you believe that anyone else who sees your pitch deck will immediately feel the same. And if that's not the case, and it often isn't, then you're spending a lot of your time chasing people to make them interested in your approach, taking more and more time and more and more risk to your business. So, so it may not be the easy approach when you take it that way. There are lots of notes here and lots of buttons to press. And the final thing, the pain of raising funds, is this the mental toughness required to take you know, rejection after rejection, the physical and mental demands of the extreme workload over such a long period of time. And it can be a, a, a painful process. And that's what I'd like to try and make easier for founders. And the final one, which is something you may have heard, if you're hearing the sort of comeback when you have more traction um, response from investors, have you heard this one? It feels like a bit of a brush off, but what investors are really saying here is get some more evidence that people want it. They don't believe your forecast. You may have failed to make 
the case that the market really needs what you're offering. So those are the pains of which we're trying to, to overcome with our approach to fundraising. So at the moment, there are three main approaches to securing significant amounts of funding. And I'm talking here about sort of advancing past things like grant funding and crowdfunding, because they're sort of specialist fundraising activities that I'm not going to be covering off today, uh, but I do have experience of, but not for today's workshop. So this is sort of significant funding at a kind of pre-seed, seed, series A level. And your first option is to use a broker. And I kind of refer to brokers as a bit like the estate agents of investment. They've got a big black book of investors, LPs, who have put money into their fund and are expecting that three times return over the, the fund lifetime. A big black book of the companies that are approaching them for funding and they kind of smoosh them all together and see what comes out. And the good news is, I mean, they're very useful brokers because they can provide great support to actually get the deal done. You know, the due diligence and negotiation, the contracts, those sorts of things. But the bad news is the chances are the deal that you get will likely be suboptimal compared to what you could have got yourself. Because if you think about it, the investors, the, the brokers, sorry, are in a position where their customers, the people that are putting money into, are the people that are putting money into their fund. And their goal, they're driven by the need to get this three times return on investment for their overall fund. They're not you know, in this to, to support the founders and get them the best deal they could. So the other good side is that although you know, brokers don't charge typically charge a fee up front, although some are moving away from this and trying to charge a monthly retainer, they act on your behalf to get you a deal. But then once the, uh, once the deal is secured and the funding is, you know, the funding you've detailed line by line is agreed with the investor, they slap their invoice down on your desk at that moment and ask for five to seven and a half percent of the finances. These finances you just justified line by line, potentially leaving you with an immediate hole in your budget. So that's the, the, the brokerage route for one. The second route, you could join an accelerator program. And again, the accelerator thinks you know, this is going to happen at speed. And accelerators do have a great role in sort of helping you learn the techniques to be successful in the market. They often would have some, a cash award um, attached to them. Sometimes that cash award is actual cash. Sometimes it's the equivalent value of the training that you're receiving. Uh, but the bad news with accelerators is if for something that evokes feelings of speed, it can be an incredibly slow option. You know, there are many technology accelerators out there of varying quality. And you have to apply for them. There's high competition for the good ones. It's a long application process. And not all of them you know, will, will end up with helping you have an offer and in front of the right investors to secure the amount of funding that you need. They often end in a kind of a graduation day of investors that are well known to the accelerator program. They may not be the, the best investors for your organization. And for something that evokes feelings of speed, they can take you know, an awful long time. And at the end of it all, with no guarantee of success, they could be asking for you know, things like a share of your company up to 6% was the last um, accelerator program that I, I reviewed. And the accelerator program's concept of sort of teaching you all the concepts you need to know to improve your offer and to improve your, your company offering relies on you then having to apply that teaching to your business and do an awful lot of work on it which I think is are, are things that you don't really need to know. Whereas I believe there is a better approach that fundraising can be something that you do under your own steam, regardless of having to be taught things that you may not need to know. And the pitch day at the end, it was more likely to be a couple of their connections with no interest or prior knowledge of your company. So the chances of getting a good deal at the end of it are, are probably very low. And that's why I see people who go through serial accelerator programs in the hope that that will secure them the investment they're looking for. But often it doesn't, and that's why. So the final option at the moment is going it alone. So the DIY option, which is, you know, as I've said, 
perceived to be the cheapest option on paper. But if it takes you 18 to 24 months, it may cost you a company. So it's hardly the cheapest version. And I think this is the, the traditional approach of creating a pitch deck and a business plan, sending it out to investors, seeing who's, who's interested, following up, sitting and waiting for the bait to be taken. And this, when I've done my research over the past two years, has got about a one in 6,000 chance of working. And I'm going to show you exactly how that was calculated, how that actually happens. And every time you're doing it on your own, obviously, if it's the first time for you, you're going to be making mistakes, which cost you even more time, all at your own cost. And in that time, while you're doing this, what can happen? You could run out of cash. Competitors could, could enter your market. So... Neither of these are particularly the ideal option going forward. So this is the sort of environment in which I decided that it was a, there was a need to produce a, a fourth option, a viable, better way for founders to raise funding. And how I sort of arrived at it is, is to start with sort of looking at how investors actually get deals done. So the next, this next section is going to be putting you in the minds of investors the ones you're hoping to secure investment from. And there's a couple of surprising insights that I found when I was doing this. And the first one is looking, when you start to look at what investors are looking for. So this little um, piece of text here, there's got a lot of words in it, but let's actually pick that apart for the important bits. Investors want to invest in world-class teams leading innovative technology firms that offer step change solutions to address attractive market opportunities. So what do they mean by world-class teams? Well, a recent survey of investors said that it was the most important factor. I think 47% of firms said it was. Interestingly, 95% of firms said it was important, and it absolutely is. At the earlier stage your technology company is, it's as much about the investment in you as a person, your founding team, your capabilities, your skill set, as it is in your offer, because all can change with your offer as you start to mature. So things like the, the ability to be resilient, to show that you've got the passion and the motivation to see this journey through, however difficult and twisty and turny it might be, those are the sort of skills they're looking for when they mean world-class teams. It's not how many years of research background you had, where you went to university, how much funding you've got in the past. It's more about you and your passion for what you're doing. Innovative technology. Well, this is the, uh, the radical innovation, creating a new market or introducing a radical innovation in an existing market or the technology that underpins either. So your ability to sort of offer something that's genuinely new to the market. Step change solutions is, uh, is basically you're either solving problems that are not currently addressed and you're providing a solution that customers can't live without. It's so much better than, or so much cheaper, so much faster than the competition. And finally, attractive market opportunities. So <laughs> this is a tricky one because investors have said that this used to be over a billion dollars in revenues over the investment period and the market's growing rapidly. But these days, with the amount of competition for funding increasing, you know, I've heard multiples of you know, 10, 20 times that for the size of the market in terms of that's something that really interests investors. But what's important when you look at this overall statement of what they're looking for is the kind of priority that, they should, that investors typically give to these four elements. So here are the elements, teams, technology, solutions, opportunities. So just as a quick exercise, why don't you go ahead and put in the chat, what order do you think is the, is the priority order for investors in these areas? Which one's most important and which one's least? Put them into the chat, you know, it might be one, two, three, four, or two, three, one, four, whatever it might be. Put them into the chat and We'll see if you agree with what I found. One, four, three, two is our first one. Four, three, two, one. So teams first, then, then opportunities, then solutions technology. We've got a couple of people saying opportunity first. 
then either teams or solutions second okay we've got someone saying the solutions would be first and then the market opportunity then the teams and the technology another one another vote for teams first and opportunity second so there's quite a variety of results so that's good because that's what I was hoping I would find so the research that I've done from my experience of working in the sector for about 22 years and the conversations I've been having with investors, this is why I feel the priority for investment firms is at the moment. Number one, market opportunities. So the size of the market opportunity trumps everything else. If there's not a big enough opportunity, then you're unlikely to attract their interest. Secondly, does your solution offer a step change to what's out there? Currently, is there a good reason to switch to your offering compared to the current solutions? And is the, are the outcomes from your solution so much better than can be achieved with anything that's existing on the market or existing alternative ways of solving the problem? Then it's teams. And then finally, it's innovative technology. And this might come as a, a bit of a shock to if, if there are any kind of academic researchers in the room, but you know, the present, the the cleverness, the innovativeness, the complexity of the science is the least important thing that investors care about. And when you focus your pitch or your, your initial story on the, on the technology and what it is and how it works, then you can see why that would be difficult for investors to understand. Whereas if you're talking about the attractive market opportunities and you're talking with an investor who's got some knowledge in that sector, then that's likely something that they will find some resonance with and they'll recognize that you're solving a big enough problem in a big enough market. So I'd be interested to see what you think about that, whether you agree or disagree. So continue to pop those into the chat if you like. Da, 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 da. I think just a sort of a quick say, the earlier it is, you know, I think the higher the team, the world-class teams element will be in their priority ladder. And so at sort of pre-seed level, it is very much about you and your founding team and as, as it is on the sides of the market opportunity. So it's going to get more and more important the earlier you are. Right. So that's sort of the insight, first of all, that the market opportunity is the most important thing they're looking for. Now, how do they go about getting deals? And it's not what you think. And here's why. So a typical investment firm will receive between three and 4,000 pitches sent by email every year. And from them, they fund on average six. So that's where the sort of 600 to one odds, if you're going down this route, you know, your pitch, your offer is gonna be compared to the on average 600 other opportunities. So you've got to stand out. But this, this approach of sending an email, whether it's via sort of a, an email to them directly or whether it's a LinkedIn DM, I spoke to an investor the other day, he receives four to five uh, DMs over uh, LinkedIn every day with pitch decks attached to them from people they, they don't know, and they have to employ people to screen them out. And that route, this is what I call the traditional approach, makes up less than 10% of the overall number of deals done by investors. The others are done either through warm introductions from people they know in their networks, from a kind of a, a more quality referral from those they potentially already funded or those that they, they trust the opinion of and those that have done some level of pre-qualification that your offer is the sort of thing that this investor might be looking for. And the final third is where investors say they get the best deals from. So they get the best deals from, and this is a quote from a, a New York City um, early stage venture firm. They said that the best opportunities don't walk into their office. We identify and research mega trends and proactively reach out to those entrepreneurs who share a vision of where the world is going, which kind of backs up the approach that they are looking at the, the market, the size of the market opportunity as the most important thing. But that this, this proactive approach relies on you as a startup founder being found. So it's not just the case of, of bombarding them with emails and hoping that the right email lands on the right investor's desk at the right time, because that can take this extraordinary length of time. 
So that's my second insight, that you know, the traditional approach to fundraising takes far too much time, effort, isn't the way investors get done, has a 6,000 to one chance of working. If you've got 601 pitches and it's only 10% of the ways they get deals done, in case you, you're a mathematician and want to know that. So I think you can see by now, hopefully, how unattractive the traditional approach to fundraising is. Initially, it seems quite easy. How could anyone not see the game-changing um, nature of your company's offer? But uh, unfortunately, every other startup believes the same. And as this you know, traditional approach, the direct approach is available to everyone, so many do it. And it's created this, what I call broken technology investment game, where you're playing and you're betting everything you've put so far into your startup on these unplayable odds of 6,000 to one. So before I talk about um, the, uh, the potential new approach, I just thought I'd give some context to who I am, who is the strange man on the internet. And I'm not gonna take you through my career history. It's not gonna be one of those type of presentations, but I just thought I'd give you a little bit of background as to who I am and tell you a little bit about my story. So my background is I've spent 22 years plus working at the intersection between science, business, and funding, building up knowledge of how to help science make an impact in the world. And that's my sort of underlying passion is that science shouldn't be creating just publications that sit on shelves and create dust. It should be adding value and solving problems that exist in the world. And I set up the company in September 2020 to help more innovative companies become commercially successful because the road to building a unicorn is just claiming far too many casualties. And although there's consulting in my company's name, I'm a very different type of, of consultant. My business model is based on sharing the knowledge to help build more unicorns. And I share that knowledge like I'm doing today uh, freely. I share the principles of my approach with everyone. And if you can use it for yourself and go off and implement it, you have the resources to do it yourself, fantastic. Just perhaps think of me when you're rich and famous. But for those that want to work with me and apply the knowledge that I built up from them, my experience, the sort of knowledge that you are typically taught needlessly within an accelerator program and apply that in a much faster way than, than people know where I am. And I know I can probably spare you from the, uh, the, the, the goriness of my, my story, but my company was started in September 20 because in January 2020, I was knocked off my bike by a 50 mile an hour Mercedes two months before the pandemic, which is great timing. And in the recovery of my sort of physical and, and mental health, I was actually diagnosed with adult ADHD. And for me, that actually helps a lot. And this is probably explains why I've created a company with these consulting offers, which help people move at much faster pace to get to where they need to be. That go-to-market launch plan, sort of the plan to, to get the next level of funding, the plan to reshape their offer to get much more alignment with what the market needs. I do that in sort of very speedy fashions using the design sprint approach to help think differently and achieve results a lot quicker. And my interventions, I don't want to be you know, a broker that takes away five to seven and a half percent of your deal at the end of it. And I'm not going to be an accelerator program that takes six percent of your company. I believe that your success is yours and I want to be rewarded, rewarded for the effort I put in to do short, sharp, impactful interventions that get results. Because for me as a founder, if I don't have the results to talk about, then my, then my reputation suffers. So I, I work with those companies where we both believe that this accelerated approach can be useful to them to get to where they want to go next, their next funding destination. So that what I'm doing at PBM Consulting is help power technology companies to achieve their next funding destination, which could be a new market launch, but it also could be for an established company offering a new product, switching to a new market, or it could be you know, getting the next level of funding for their company's development. Oh, ignore that phone. Okay, how I work, very briefly, I won't talk you through this too much, is basically a staged offer to make it affordable to uh, those companies who are bringing something new to the market and for whom they want to get a much more 
vibrant and attractive offer that attracts them the interest of investors and customers. So first of all, we do a process that I call fit to fly, which is the pre-flight checks on where your organization is now. And I use that in a workshop to pull together the most compelling story that creates an emotional response in the audience that it's intended for. And if that's investors, that's something that they can really see the size of the market opportunity and how different your solution is. And that fit to fly output can often be the starting point for a company's marketing to help raise their awareness in the market of what they're doing. And in particular, the problem they solve for. I then work with companies in what I call flight plan, which is exactly that. It's the plan of how you're going to get to your next destination, the development that will be needed in order for you to rock up at your end destination in front of the fund that you've targeted and have all the things in place to secure that, that deal. I can often stop working with companies at the planning stage and then hand the plan back to them for implementation. But if the company needs me to sort of fill in, fill in any gaps in their team without employing staff of their own, then I can bring in experts from my network, for example, on sales or branding or digital development um, that to help you get to your next funding destination. So my final approach offer helps you land and secure that next destination safely. So that's my kind of introduction. So hopefully you'll see that you know, I've got a little bit of context and background to what I'm doing. Then I'll talk to you about what I've developed and how you can access it to see if this is the best way for you to take control of your fundraising strategy and to secure the funding and particularly secure that investor engagement that you're looking for. Looking through. So this development you know, of a faster, more attractive, more affordable, better approach that puts founders in control of their strategy is what really I've been working on for the last two years at PBM Consulting. And what is it is a, an approach that I've used and applied in a, some coaching assignments to help founders engage investors for their technology startup. And I think it's fundraising is something that you should never, as a founder, outsource to a, a, a third party for the same reason that I uh, don't recommend using brokers, because they are not the best people to represent your company. They don't sell with the same passion. They don't exhibit the same passion for the company that you have as the founder. I believe the skills that you need to take control of your own fundraising process uh, can be learned. But unlike you know, a, you know, some of these sort of free courses or the, the lower cost courses you can see on the internet, what I've developed is not just a training program of the skills needed, but also in a kind of an implementation framework. So as you go through the course, you're given templates and guides to fill in. You, so how you demonstrate and implement the approach step by step to implement the system, implement and uh, the approach to get more engagement from investors as you go along. There's not a big, long training course you have to go through and then start work. It's a kind of a training and implementation in one go. I could even call it an accelerator, but I haven't. And what I've designed, done is design five detailed modules that you can go through, each designed to address some of the key issues that prevents you from successfully engaging with investors with, a, with the right offer for them. And I'll talk you through what they are in a moment. And as well as that, I, there's an opportunity I've put some bonus content into the course that help you sort of perform in a pitch meeting to get that follow on meeting as well, and some support to help you design you know, the most attractive offer to get in front of investors. So that's what it is. There we go. But just to sort of answer any questions in advance. You know, I've outlined here you know, the, the typical stages in a quite linear model here, of course, just for simplicity's sake, are the typical stages in securing investment from securing funding from an investor. You know, from you know, getting all the way up to that pitch meeting and then the due diligence process, development of a, an offer, the heads of terms, the due diligence in detail, the negotiation, the legal structure of the deal, those sort of things. But just to sort of point out that the driven process covers these stages. It's from where you are now, getting the right offer, getting total laser-like clarity of what you're asking for in terms of funding, but also more importantly, 
in terms of the resources that you'll need from the investment partner, how you target investors and find the right ones for your startup, how you approach them, how you engage them in those 90% of ways that the investors' deals get done, not just relying on cold emails or DMs, and then how you can perform in that pitch meeting. So it covers you getting that investor engagement. So, and the, the steps and the approach have been designed and they've been validated with investors and founders. And I'll talk you through a quick case study of the proven results I've got already. There are shortcuts to the fundraising process, and that's, that's the sort of knowledge that I wanted to get across into this course. So you don't have to make the mistakes that you would typically make if you're going out and doing this on your own. So the first module looks at the, right, looks at the required founder mindset. And we go through three of the major sort of mindset uh, mistakes that founders can typically make unknowingly, which will scupper their chances of success with the investor. We then go through the offer, so what you've got and how to make that as appealing and attractive to the investors that you're targeting as possible. Module three starts the finding process. Um, so it helps develop that sort of long list of investment partners that are, have been specially targeted, especially found to be a better match for your investment opportunity than just a, a random search. Stage four is when we start to evaluate those. And this is where we really sort of turn the tables on the, the broken technology investment again. And I'll teach you step by step of how to pre-qualify and how to assess investors so that they are fit to receive the offer that you're presenting them. Because I don't believe that any, just anyone should be seeing your pitch deck. I believe you should be putting your time and effort just into those that are much more, that have been pre-qualified and are much more likely to respond positively rather than this broad spraying and praying approach. And then the final offer, uh, which I'm in the way of, is the method of doing it. So basically putting it into play. So taking the, 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 the priority targets that, for investors that we've identified and then using those main three routes uh, that are, exist outside of the traditional approach to get um, engagement from them and get in front of them. So that's what it is. Probably the question you've got is, does this work? So this is one of the clients that I applied the, the driven methodology to. I was actually employed on a, a European bank funded program. So I would, they were able to afford my sort of mentoring and coaching to coach them through the driven approach. And their issue was they were wanting to get um, initial attraction and build a market for their new um, health and wellness app. But at the same time, put them in a better position to be receiving investment. So I work with them to mentor them in the approach, this smarter approach to engage investors. And the outcome from this is that I was able to secure for them the attention and a, a contract from a global telecoms operator, which gave them immediate access to a market of about 2 million customers and got them into the corporate's um, accelerator program as well. So really positioned them well for the next round of investment. So yes, I know that it works. It's not a guarantee. I wish I could give a guarantee. What it needs to be successful is the approach properly applied and implemented. And that's why the training program is so much more than just, here's what you need to do, off you go and do it. It's providing the implement the frameworks to implement this approach fully as you go along and provide you with the resources to do that, the step-by-step approaches, templates, guides, assignments that you'll need to complete in between each module. So you're implementing, you're drawing up that list of targeted investors as you go along. The major determining factor, of course, is whether you've got the right offer and only the market can decide whether you know, the, about the quality of the, the offer. But what I'll help you with during the, the program is to refine and present your offering in a way that makes it clear and that makes it really attractive to investors and shows a lot more than just you know, the words on a pitch deck. And finally, just using my kind of driven um, automotive um, analogies and taking it to the next level, do you have NOS? Do you have that secret ingredient that propels your proposition to help you win the race? Is what you've got genuinely new 
genuinely different and substantially better, step change better than what's currently out there. So those three things really need to be in place for this approach to work. Okay. So what I, what I did was just look at, as I've mentioned several times about the length of time that the existing approach can take and the risks of doing that. You just have you sort of compare what options you've got out there in a timeline. So step one, or approach number one, is to use the broker. And yes, a broker is probably the fastest way of doing it if you're prepared to accept the downsides that come with uh, using a broker, that potentially suboptimal deal and the tightness of the budget after they take five to seven and a half percent out of it. But it, that's probably the fastest way of doing it, probably, because at least they know they have active investors in the fund, they have funds ready to deploy and like mushing these two Black, big black books together. You know, there's a hope that you can get a good match or a good enough match to sign a deal within a short period of time. The second approach, accelerator programs, generally take an awful lot longer because you've got the initial period of the application process and waiting for the accelerator program to start. Then you've got this period where they teach you, needlessly, things that you should be applying to your business to help develop your offer and your proposition. And you have to then apply all that knowledge to your own business under your own steam. And then you get the graduation day where you're finally able to sort of start pitching to investors. So it's probably going to be about, you know, again, these are approximations, about a sort of 12 month period if you're going down the accelerator route. The DIY option is by far the longest, the slowest, and overall the most labor intensive process that you go through. And I've just used there in 18 months as a kind of rough guide. There was one company who wanted me to work with them for free, who'd been trying to bashing down the doors of investors in a very sort of spray and pray approach, untargeted approach for four years. And how their, how their company was able to survive for four years without significant income or significant revenue is beyond me. But this is exactly what I want to be trying to stop. I've just used 18 months there to show that the, the DIY process can take an awful, extraordinary long amount of time. And the final, this fourth option that I've developed is, oh, there we go, coming back again, is only takes to probably slightly longer than the broker, but has a, the result that you, you're likely to get a far more appealing and uh, workable deal than going down the brokerage route. I think my Zoom screen is resizing as we go along, which is exciting. There we go. So those are the timings of them. But just to summarize what we've talked about so far in the different three options, the cost of this, the brokerage route could be five to seven and a half percent of what you've raised. And, and you'll likely end up with a suboptimal deal, one that favors the investors getting their return back and actually gives you the greatest chance of success. The accelerator program could take upwards of well, about 6% of your company in equity at the end of it, including and also the, the time it takes. The DIY option, DIY option in terms of costing this, I think this is the biggest warning factor for me is this, if it takes that long, then potentially your company is burning through 18 months of your monthly burn rate, which is you know, a huge amount of, of investment to put in. And it might be mask because it's not directly going out the door but this is the cost to you and this is why it's by far the cheapest option um, available to you so finally i position driven at a cost of less than a thousand pounds purely so that this could be affordable and accessible by founders as a viable um, fourth approach where there's nothing to be you know, trade it off. No, you're not sharing a, a share of your company. You're not sharing a, 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 seg a slice of the money that you've raised. This program helps you and develops the skills and capability for you to do fundraising yourself, take control of your strategy and to do it for an awful lot less cost than it would be to spend 18 months working out the best way to do it and learning by experience. So that's kind of how the options stack up for me. Um, oh, yeah. 
Thank you. It's all in the chat. Lovely. Brilliant. Oh, we've got a crowdfunding consultant in the audience. Excellent. Yeah, crowdfunding is uh, uh, like grant funding, a completely separate um, topic, but a very useful um, skill set to, to learn. So I look forward to connecting with you. So, how are you feeling? I presented you know, what I believe and what the evidence from my clients says is a genuine fourth option to raise funds. It's proven, it's faster, potentially it's affordable, and it's designed for those like you who are bringing something that's genuinely new to the market. So, oh, the advanced Zoom background doesn't let me use GIFs. So ready to ask, you know, how are you feeling? Are you the left-hand side homer? The way this sounds like a good offer, or are you retreating back into the hedge like the right hand side Homer? So, if this is something that you'd like to explore, I'm happy to chat through with you in a, in a call, in a one to one call, well, how this might work for your company. And what I've been doing this month, because it's launching um, in January. And obviously we're all, it's Blue Monday today, and it's obviously a, the cost of living crisis is biting hard with lots of people. I want to make this, this offer and this, this way forward, a generally better way of approaching engaging investors affordable for founders. So I've put together a cost of living um, discount for the month of January, which will expire on, on February the 1st. So I'll give you a link in a moment. And the voucher code of Lean January um, to get 20% off the, the current uh, price of the course. So I've talked you through you know, how difficult growing a company is, the, something that brings something that's genuinely new to the market, how difficult that is. We've discussed the three main current options available along these, alongside these often unpal unpalatable options are presented a genuine fourth option the founders raising funds, one that's smarter, more affordable, more targeted, and puts you back in control of the fundraising process and stops you chasing investors for the next 18 months. I talked you through a case study of the approach to show you how we've got results for a technology founder using it and how you can both learn and implement the driven approach in my upcoming course. So if you'd like to know more, and you'd like to have a short call to see if it can work for you and see how it can work for your business, then drop me a, a message into the chat that says, call me. Or you can be very digitally enabled. I'll get out of the way here. And you can use your phone to scan this QR code, which will take you to a link to book a short 15 minute meeting with me where we can discuss if it's the right option for you and your business. I will follow up after this workshop by email with some further resources are designed to help you. There'll be slides and a recording from today. There'll be a video I produced on the number one skill that investors say that all founders should master to attract their attention. There's an, another exercise, a kind of a video walkthrough of an exercise that you can do to determine your current level of product market fit, which is probably the single most important factor in your overall um, to commercial success. There's a place that you can sign up to my newsletter to receive tips on how to build a unicorn, uh, LinkedIn feed, and some other things as well. If there is anything else that you think would be useful to your company to be in that fo uh, special folder that I'll email you afterwards, then do let me know into the chat. We're keen to know if there's anything that particularly you'd like to ask about. And we do, of course, have the ability to answer questions now. We've taken a little bit longer than I thought, but I'm available for the next few moments, as long as you need really, if there are any questions that you would like answered. So for those of you in the LinkedIn, sorry, in the, uh, the Zoom, you can unmute or you can ask your question uh, via the chat. And for those of you who are watching this after the obligatory one minute delay on LinkedIn Live, please feel free to pop your questions into the comments section. Okay, all right, um, question in the, in the chat about what about the balance between getting known and competitors' IP theft? Does this work? That's a really interesting question, thank you. I had this kind of objection raised um, when I was working with a client who was considering a crowdfunding campaign. 
that a competitor in this space had previously launched a crowdfunding campaign for their own company. And from the details that were, were online about the company, because it was an equity-based crowdfunding campaign, one where shares in the company were up for, for grabs rather than early stage prototype products. And the amount of information they gave away in the, um, in the, the materials they provided for the crowdfunding campaign enabled this company to sort of basically steal a march on where they were and understand exactly where their competitors were. So IP theft, I don't think is, is a particular issue because you should never be talking in open communications about anything that's, you know, that's confidential and uh, a trade secret to yourself. But you're right, you know, raising awareness does have the ability to raise awareness to people who might want to, to follow, you, follow you. And first mover advantage it does go an awful long way in the science and technology world, as long as you're able to you know, keep that momentum going and to, to remain and to have that first mover advantage. And therefore, you're in a better position to do the next iteration of the, the product once it's out in the market and keep ahead of your competitors with you know, hopefully the right amount of, of intellectual property protection to prevent people from directly copying. But yeah, that, that is a risk. So thank you. That's a really good point for highlighting that. That, you know, if you are doing you know, a large amount of you know, marketing and awareness raising about your um, startup to attract the attention of investors, you also might be attracting the attention of people who might want to come in and compete as well. But hopefully your offer is sufficiently um, complex that it would be difficult to copy or prevented from copying by a formal IP protection. So hopefully that answers your question, Sanako, but if you want to follow up, do give me a call or pop me in my diary. I'm very happy to chat to founders. I spend the majority of my day doing it and I love doing it. Any other questions? Can't see anything on LinkedIn. Takes a bit of a while to filter through, I've learned from my experience. But yeah. If there is there anything else you want to know, you know where I am. I live my life on LinkedIn. And if you ever want to talk, oh, um, then you can use this QR code and book a meeting with me to discuss. So, Farin, so the, as I answer the question on, on LinkedIn, uh, the, what I've talked to you through, the, the Driven course, is a, I've targeted it at founders as a digital course with the implementation framework to help implement as you go along. I'm not targeting this as a sort of a consultancy offer because my market research would indicate that most founders who are at that early stage will probably be planning all of their money into the startup funds and they're unlikely to work with consultants. So the driven offer can be a standalone offering. You go through the course, you go through the implementation uh, framework that I've provided for you step by step. So you can apply this approach to your fundraising and basically run this in a much smarter, more targeted, affordable way. But for those founders who are able to access a, a, a bit more of a budget and want to apply my sort of skills and knowledge in a more targeted way via one-to-one -one consulting, then that's what I do in the flight path approach I talked about earlier. So we work with clients up front to assess their business and formulate and put together the most attractive offering and story around their offer that kickstarts their marketing to get the fee paying passengers for the journey. And then I work with them one-to-one -one via a series of collaborative workshops to formulate that plan of how they're going to get to their funding destination in the least amount of time possible. So the purpose of this workshop is to share my knowledge with you about the different routes for, for funding, for you to decide which one is the best for you, to present my digital um, training and implementation course as a viable fourth option. And if others want to then get in touch with me as someone who they think can help them, they know where I am. And that's five o'clock. me, time flies. Thank you to all those that attended. Thanks for your uh, engagement and your questions and comments. Um, I will be following up with you via, via email just to give you this access to all these potential resources. But if there's anything else that you want to know, then you know exactly how to find me here on LinkedIn most hours of the day.
so I think that's about it. Thank you all for attending. And uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing from you in the future. I shall stop this now and stay in the Zoom meeting for a bit if anyone wants to ask any questions there. Hopefully I'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>